Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Detour Live podcast. Thanks for joining us. Another bonus app on a Sunday. It's sort of our Christmas present to all you loyal listeners. I'm your host, Dan Jones, joined as always by Mr. Bay Critz or Lexus of Blackburn Bay Critz himself. Johnny trevorrow has got his banner hanging up. It's it's not in the best position, John, because you're blocking out a few of your key sponsors, mate. Like you've got to look after them. You sort of half your head's cutting it out, but uh, I would have thought after doing it for the last two weeks, you would have got it dialed by now. Yeah, you'd think so. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're, of course, joined by a regular on the show, uh, Head Sports Director of Team Bike Exchange, Matt White, who, let's be honest, Whitey, you don't have much else to do. You're in hotel quarantine or isolation or what What do they call it? Pre, uh, oh, prison. Yeah. Pre, pre, <laughs> prison. Yeah. 72 hour self isolation, but um, I've had plenty to do in the last 48 hours besides uh, breaking up fights between the children. Oh, yeah, yeah they come to the blows this afternoon with uh, the two oldest ones had a bloody nose. Uh, oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my, my, as you know, Jonesy, my, my kids are not the quietest of children. <laughs> and uh, when you put them in a hotel room for a couple of days with no with no physical activity and not too much to do except annoy each other, uh, it, it's stuff is going to happen, isn't it? <laughs> 100%, mate. 100%. I was almost a late scratching myself because have a look at this bruise. I thought it was a spider bite. So I started freaking out at about 4.30, but uh, apparently it's just a bruise. Um, so, you know. It's going to be a testing 24 hours myself, uh, so we'll wait and see. I, I messaged Dr. John Trevorrow, and uh, he, he was pretty nervous. What was your advice? Well, I, I, I went to uh, the real doctor in my family, the K, who uh, is an expert. She watches every medical show on television, uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, no, no, she didn't think it was a spider bite. She said, probably a spider, a, a snake bite. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's definitely not a snake or a spider bite, it's just a bruise. I don't know how I got it, but anyway, we're off we're off track. Um, it's obviously been a big news period for you guys with the signing of uh, Dylan Grunewagen. Uh, we talked about it on the show a couple of days ago, but um, yeah, great signing for you guys. And and how did all that come about? Well, it came about uh, because at the end of the day, Jumbo Jumbo Bismar, um informed Dylan that he. Um, he wouldn't be riding the Tour de France while Primoz Rodjek was around and, and trying to target winning the Tour de France. So uh, he had a couple of years left on his contract. He wasn't a rider who was on our radar because of because of that fact. Um, we were looking sort of in longer term range for a um, yeah 2023 for, for a world class sprinter, but um, it, it came on the market quite unexpected and uh, it's been a big pickup for us. And I think it, it'll be a game changer. For um, especially yeah, just to get us up and running, especially um, with a with a world class sprinter on the roster and a guy who's really keen to uh, get back to the level, has seen him have so much success yeah. over the years. Yeah. If he, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the Australian fans think of Michael Matthews as a world class sprinter, but he, he's not. He's a world class one day rider, and because he's got so much ability, he just gets up there in the sprints. But he actually doesn't like it. He's not a natural sprinter, so he's been forced to do something he actually doesn't even enjoy doing, and that's those big bunch sprints. So this will will this mean that Michael is going to get an opportunity to do what he's really best at, getting up the road and getting into the right moves? Yeah, it, it will, John. And we, we, we were already in discussion with Michael at the end of the season. Um, and the big game changer for Michael is, you know, he... He had a template that that had has has worked quite successfully in the past, and it's basically, you know, he was one of those guys that yeah, you know, that very few sprinters had his climbing ability. So when there was a, a, a reduced group kick, he would be in a, in a very pretty very elite group of riders like Peter Sagan who could contest those finals. Now what's changed in the last three to four years is these freaks from cyclocross, who. Uh, who can climb at a very similar level and are just as, just as if not faster. You know, your Pidcocks, your, your Van Arts and your Vanderpools, and that has changed the game. So we were already talking to my, Michael at the end of the season about changing his tact and, and the way he raced, and that, that's more aggressive, more unpredictable, and, and do, things, do things that we've already seen him do, like, like in the Tour de France there where he finished third on a um, – on a on a medium mountain stage in the Pyrenees, and, and that's that's the sort of the tactic, the sort of tactic that he will have to 
adopt a lot more next year if we're going to get him back in the winner's circle. Uh, I've got a couple of live comments, obviously, from any super fan. Hi, Dan, John, and Matt. I still don't have Wing Dog's number. Ha. Um, yeah, I'm happy to give you Wing Dog's number, Wendy. I'm sure I'd love a call from you uh, later on. Uh, Jason Cruz, is this a money ball logic buy? I'm sure Dylan is undervalued and motivated. Looking forward to the bike exchange, JK, going back for more stage win focus. It's a good point because we had um, Simon Clark and Lee Howard on last episode, and they're talking about. You know, in the last sort of 10, 15 years, the importance of data nowadays in, in cycling and, and looking at numbers and things like that. Is that one of the things that you look at when you're signing new guys now, more so in the in the last couple of years? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. It all, all, you know, a lot of it does depend on the role you're looking for those guys to achieve. But um, for someone like Dylan, um, yeah, it, it's fact that you know he knows how to win he's been there before he's only 28 years of age obviously he's had a quite a year and a half due to COVID and obviously the incident there that happened at Tour of Poland but that's all behind him now and uh, and it, like I said it's it, it's been a degree a money ball opportunity because at the end of the day we weren't looking for it he came to us and uh, when we got the opportunity there we uh, we took it with two hands and it's going to be exciting but as far as you know I think what's changed, especially in the last three to four years, is you know, all the teams are really... You know, when you send the likes of Bernal and Project Car and those guys, you know, every team's looking for that next superstar. And and the way they're guaranteeing... Well, not, not the way they're guaranteeing, but the way they're really looking is they are going through a lot more data. And, and at the end of the day, your climbers, you know, numbers don't lie. At the end of the day, you can be as talented as you want, but there's certain numbers that climbers have to put out to um, to be effective on the climbs and, and effective on general classification, and you can see that pretty quickly. Whereas the sprinters, you know, power is one thing, but, uh, you know, reading a sprint, getting that that sense of, of timing and, and uh, a good set of swingers is uh, things that can't be measured by data alone, can they? No, exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was getting excited looking at some of the riders you were signing as the towards the end of the season, uh, and, and the biggest problem to me seemed to be that you didn't have a, like a Dylan Grunner weekend. So as soon as he came into the mix, I thought, "Wow, it makes all the other things you've been doing just so much more effective." I'm especially excited to see Lawson Craddock, who he's not a youngster; I think he's twenty nine, but he impresses me the way he rides on the front. And he lead, can lead out in the sprints. He's a, a real mix of everything. I, I, I think he's a great uh, acquisition. No, he is, John. He is. And he, he was looking for change. Uh, he's been six years at EF. Um, and he'll be a guy that will be pulling in, uh, like I said, a very versatile character. And, you know, when you're running teams of seven in most races and eight, eight in a Grand Tour, they're the type of riders that, uh, that I think are, are quite undervalued uh, when you're looking at trying to – well, they're undervalued on a team that is – yeah, you know, we haven't got a bottomless pit of a budget like some teams do, and so you've got to you've got to you've got to pick up some good buys and guys that guys that I see are undervalued uh, on other teams, and I think Lawson uh, Lawson is going to fit in really well. I've just come directly from a camp in Spain uh, in the last twenty four hours, and uh, he's going to fit in into our team super, and I'm looking forward to uh, to assimilating him in the team for uh, for next year and. He'll be getting some big targets for us. He's going to play a big role. You, you're talking about budgets. Um, is there been a big inflation with sort of riders' salaries? Because there was a big, oh, I suppose it was an issue when um, Tinkoff, remember he was throwing around big bucks to get guys like Sargent and Contador and all that. And then that just bumps up everyone's salary. And then there was talk a couple of months ago with um, Pagacha that he was being offered, you know, triple his contract to go across to Ineos, which they're talking about 18 million euro a year. Even the chat around that, does that have an effect on even the, the lower tier sort of guys on, on what they demand based on what the top tier guys get? Uh, I think I think it hasn't had too much effect. I think it's I think it's stabilising now with with your, your normal type of riders. Look, the, the the general market has gone up an incredible amount in the last five to ten years. An incredible amount, guys. Guys, you know, there was there was guys riding, for example, you know, riding in some of the biggest teams in the world ten years ago. Workers, you know, making a hundred thousand euro a year. Now that's that's 
Yeah, we're, you're basically paying not too much less than that for the best Neo Pros in the world now. So that's the sort of market change we've seen in the last last 10 years. But I think that the top end of the market has uh, got a little bit out of control there. Just from uh, just from a, a, a couple of teams, it turned turned into a bit of an arms race. And then when you look at, you know, guys you know, at Ineos, for example, you know, they've, they'll start a Tour de France with... Um, with nearly their whole roster on more than a million euro a year, and other most teams have got lucky if they've got more than two riders on that, and, and they've got a team of eight on on that much, plus another team of eight on the sidelines getting ready for their next race. So, I, I, th- I think the big change I've seen in the last three to four years is is with the young guys. So, every like I said before, everyone's looking for that next superstar and try to unearth that next superstar, but they're also not giving those young guys uh, a chance to settle. So what you know before when when you saw, when you signed a young talented kid, no matter where they're from, you would usually give them, yeah, you, know, you get the standard two year contract which you have to give. But the most teams would give that third year just for that kid to settle in if he it was a bit of a slow developer, a bit of a slow burn. But what I've seen in the last two to three years is uh, teams just cutting those blokes loose, and and it's like, well, it didn't work out how we thought. Next, on to the next one. So there's probably more more kids getting opportunities to turn professional, but the market has become a lot more cutthroat than it was in the past. I was just going to say, I was going to say, it must piss off the the older guys that have been in the Palo for 10, 15 years, seeing some of the cash that these young guys are getting. And some of it's just on data alone. Like, you know, they're going, well, hang on, these guys, are their data's great, but they still don't have the fundamentals. You know, to yeah. navigate the bunch and all this sort of stuff. Like, geez, I know if you, if you were in the in the Palo, you'd be whinging nonstop. <laughs> oh, it's a different world, but I mean, that's the whole thing, though. It's it, it, that, this data is amazing, and uh, uh, look at young Jay Vine. You know, uh, met his teammates the night before the race and ended up running second in the Tour of Hungary or Turkey, whichever Turkey. one it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. But look, I'll, I'll tell you, Wally, I was impressed with where you've got with some of your new signings. You've gone for speed and for uh, uh, in the mountains. You've got um, young uh, Kel O'Brien coming out of our uh, one of our track squads, bronze medalist in the games, uh, and uh, world multi world champion young Campbell Stewart, the uh, Kiwi. And then also you've got uh, young Penna. Is it Jesus David Penna? I don't know whether they call David or Jesus, Jesus but. Jesus, Jesus, he's good. He can climb. <laughs> Colombian in 21. And I like that young um, Sabrero, the Italian, who, who actually beat Ghana in a time trial, I think, for the national title uh, uh, this yeah. year. Yeah, so yeah, uh, you've really got a little bit, uh, a, a really good cross section of uh, good youngsters coming in. And now that you've got a sign, Grona Vegan as well, and some of these guys are going to fit in, in really well. Yeah, we have. We, we've definitely gone. We've definitely gone down that youth avenue uh, f- for the next couple of years, and I think uh, you know, with the COVID, with COVID, with everything that's happened in the last two years, we uh, you know we, we got a little bit stunted there with some of our development plans. But that's uh, that's all behind us now, and uh, we're looking forward to um, developing another another batch of young, talented riders along with the guys we've already got. So yeah, I, I agree, John. I think we've. We've covered uh, our necessities, and uh, we're looking. We've, you know, we've lost some older, experienced guys, but at the end of the day, the sport's changing and it's changing quickly. And you've got to you've got to be able to adapt. And uh, you know, you've just got to find that balance between the ex- enough experience around those young guys to develop at a good speed as well. But uh, no, I'm excited about the roster, and uh, and certainly Dylan has uh, has been the icing on the cake. And uh, he's going to give us a lot of options to win right throughout the year, and uh, that will start in February. And you mentioned uh, uh, some of the ones that are leaving, but I'll tell you what, chapeau to the team for that beautiful uh, send-off you did for uh, Esteban uh, Chavez. Oh, I've got the video I, if you want to watch it. I think I look, it was just a beautiful thing. Not many teams do a nice send-off to that when a, pl- when a rider's going to another team. But he's been such a part of the character of that. Yeah, I don't oh, know. Let, let, let's, let's fire so, it up. It's only a couple of minutes, so here's that tribute to Esteban. They just can't be wrong. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, great video, great tribute. And uh, obviously, it's an amazing story, um, Esteban, even getting him across to the team uh, and to see, you know, the rider that he developed into uh, must make you pretty proud when when you see all the things that he achieved in the time uh, with Green Edge. Yeah, definitely, Jonesy. Look, the uh, uh, for the people who know the story there, we we took a bit of a punt on, uh, on Esteban. He obviously showed he was... Uh, had a lot of talent as a as an under twenty three, winning to a an year. But um, we picked him up when he was very much off the radar with a career career threatening injury, and um, and the rest is history. Uh, look, it, it's been eight eight very very successful years. There's been its ups and downs, but that's sport, that's life, and uh, you know that he's been part of our journey and development as a, as a team. And uh, I think it's only fitting that. Uh, we show him the respect that he deserves for everything that he's achieved for our team over the years. Now, uh, we're going to have a quick drinks break, and then when we come back, it's like the old 80s TV show we talked up last time. It's Whitey and the Wing Dog, because uh, the Wing Dog's returning back to the kennel. Uh, so we're going to pick his brain, and let's be honest, it's always entertaining when you chat to Wing Dog because he shoots from the hip. So quick drinks break, and we'll be back with more. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs. Semi-amateurs. And pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns and rides. Life is like a two-way street. It's about consideration and mutual respect. Roads are much the same. However you get around, walk, ride or drive, if we share our roads, we can all be safer. The Amy Gillett Foundation is Australia's peak cycling safety charity. Our mission is for safe cycling in Australia. Our vision is for zero cyclist deaths. Over the last year, we've seen an enormous increase in people taking up cycling, whether it be for recreation, with the family, commuting, or even to start your own cycling career. We need to do more to make it safer for every cyclist. 
20 cyclists every day are hospitalised and one cyclist is killed every 10 days on Australian roads. So, the next time you jump on your bike or hop in your car, remember to practice the four C's. Be courteous, calm, considerate and conscientious. Every cyclist's death is preventable and we all deserve to get home safely. Please donate to help the Amy Gillett Foundation make the road safer for you and for me. Thanks again to Bike Exchange and the Amy Gillett Foundation. And we're joined live from the Netherlands uh, by Peter Weening. Now, Wean Dog, this is a family show and, and please watch your language, but yeah, little fellas there, so I think we're safe. What's going on, mate? You're in lockdown again. I am, mate. Uh, uh, today, actually, in Holland, there are uh, really strict uh, restrictions now. Uh, everything is shut down. All the pubs are, are closed again. Um, only uh, the, the supermarkets and uh, the pharmacies are open uh, during the day. So everybody's in, uh, in a real strict uh, lockdown here. And I'm also in a lockdown because, uh, yeah, I'm just recovered from, uh, from the COVID virus. And uh, I still feel it a little bit. So, yeah. Something uh, the fire is just something serious. I can tell you. Well, I didn't. I didn't know that. When when did you contract COVID? A couple of weeks ago. Uh, I reckon ten days ago. But um, uh, it's just uh, yeah. I was just sneezing a little bit and uh, nothing too bad. But uh, but afterwards, uh, my taste and smell and uh, appetite of food all all is gone for a few days now. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm feeling okay again, but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, the whole of family now is in, uh, in, uh, in sort of a lockdown, and uh, yeah, so we have to stay inside for a couple of days more, and then uh, everybody is free again to go. Iffy. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, what is it? Just a, a short. What's the this lockdown you've got in in Holland at the moment, in the Netherlands? Is it just a one week lockdown? Is that correct? Uh, what I was feeling was it was it was sort of flu. Uh, um, yeah, uh, a little bit uh, pain in the throat. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, a running nose and stuff like that. So nothing, nothing too bad. But in the end, uh, every morning when you wake up, it feels like uh, you just tired. And uh, so that continues for a couple of days or maybe a couple of weeks. But 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 I'm not feeling sick anymore. So that's a uh, that's that's a good thing about it. Yeah. Do you want to say they're something, Wally? Yeah, so they're, they're, what, uh, they're, they're gone into lockdown till the 14th of January. So all right over Christmas. So uh, they're, they're in a pretty, pretty heavy lockdown for the next three, the next three, three weeks. Yeah, that's, wow. that, that, that would be a big period too for the Dutchies to want to get out to the pubs and, and obviously enjoy the Christmas period. Um, the, how's the country taking it, Wayne Dog? Just in their stride? Uh, no, they say it's allowed to invite four people. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a, a bit of a strange Christmas again. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think also with this, uh, with this kind of days, uh, a lot of people uh, stick together and stuff like that, and that's something they don't want to have right now. Mm. So that's the uh, that's the thing. Uh, they shut everything down just before uh, Christmas Day and New Year. So then they hope uh, the numbers uh, go down again instead of uh, rising. That everybody sticks together. And also, you know, like here it's it's cold, so everybody stays inside. And uh, that's yeah. If you if, if the fire is running around in the house or or in Australia, you can do like New Year's outside. It's something different than uh, than staying all together and stick together in a pub or in. Uh, yeah, in some somebody's uh, kitchen. Now we were saying earlier that uh, you're returning to the kennel. You signed on as a as a sports director next year. Uh, you must be pretty excited about getting back in the world tour, mate. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a last moment uh, call, but uh, yeah, I'm really happy with it. Uh, yeah, a bit surprised for me as well, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm really happy uh, with this opportunity. Now, I was going to say, Whitey, Whitey, how did uh, how did it all come about? How did you uh, pick on the wean dog and bring him back to the kennel? Yeah, so um, uh, so uh, one well, unfortunately, Julian won't be coming back to the team. Julian Dean won't be coming back to the team next year. And uh, so Julian, there's a couple, of, a couple of people that we've lost in the, in the last four months. Yeah, Matt Wilson, uh, Julian, and uh, and Kevin Tabata as well. 
and and Renzo to the side. And what I was thinking as well, you know, there, there is there is people out there with experience, but for me, what really needs to be the best benefit for us is someone who understood our culture. And uh, you know, Pete, Pete's been around. Oh. Uh, he'll be new to the sports section game, but he'll pick that up very quickly. But what what I what I know about Peter, with the years I've been working with him as well, is he understands our culture. He understands Wayne. What you see is what you get, and uh, and he's going to fit in really well with uh, with our group. And uh, looking forward to have uh, working with Peter on this side of the fence and uh, and uh, getting, getting the ship back on track and uh, and doing what we do best. And that was uh, that's winning. I think I think you've got your your finger just hanging over the microphone a bit there, Whitey, on your on your lappy. Is we got the guts of it, but it, it sounded some bits you're talking underwater. But um, with with Wean Dog, how how are you going to bring across? Because as a rider, I mean, I remember used to watching you in time trials, just in the big chain ring, and you you were quite an aggressive style. You're calculated, but you know you you race with a, a bit of grunt. Um, what are some of the things you want to pass on? To, to the riders in, in a director sportive role. Uh, yeah, also as a rider, uh, you know uh, the kind of things you're good at, and also the things you're kind of uh, you're, you're not good at. So um, yeah, the thing is you have to find a sort of a mix. You know, uh, uh, of course, uh, I had some good good things uh, what I did, but also. For me, there were also a lot of things to, that I could improve, you know. And now cycling nowadays is, uh, is, is already further than 10 years ago. And, uh, yeah, uh, for sure, I, I can learn something. Uh, but I think we also got a great bunch of uh, coaches uh, beside us. And they know all, all, all the things about training details and stuff like that. And... Uh, and uh, and the things what what sports directors uh, can give them is uh, I think is more more or less uh, race tactics and stuff like that. What what do you think the keys are to being a good sports director? Oh, I think the the number one is um, having having a connection with you with, with with your group. I, I think you've got to be able to you know read the room, uh, understand the culture that you're working within, and the, the big change for me over the last fifteen years is you know when. When I first became a sports director, we had a team, we had three sports directors and one coach. And, and just the auxiliary staff and people to support the, the director's group is a lot bigger now. So, you know, being able to communicate with I think we have five different coaches now, six sports directors, the high performance staff around us is a hell of a lot better, uh, a lot more detailed, and being able to utilize those resources. To help your athletes, and at the end of the day, our, our key role is is like Peter said, it's tactics, it's man management, and and getting the most out of your individual athletes, but in that team environment. If you notice that you've got uh, another duchy coming in, in in Tristan Hoffman, who, if I remember correctly, was a teammate of Stewie's back back in the old days, um, and I, I, I met him when he rode Sun Tour. Gee, I can't remember what year it was now. I just wrote some to it. But, uh, yeah, a, a real good guy. So uh, a very experienced. So, so we're a, bit, a bit, bit careful with the Dutch Mafia taking over, mate. No, Hobby, Hobby's, uh, Hobby's not new to the to the directing game. He's uh, He's been on Bahrain, Bahrain, Bank. <laughs> Of and uh, and HC, and even HTC. Uh, yeah. So look, he, he's going to fit in really well with the group we put together for for the next couple of years. Um, do you have any idea of sort of the race programs for some of the guys? We've got some live comments. Uh, Tony uh, Hemming wants to know: Will Grunewagen ride the classics? Uh, select selective ones, yes. Obviously, the ones that suit his characteristics, one hundred percent. So I, I don't know. You won't be seeing him at Tour of Flanders, um, but some of the flatter, flatter Belgium races, yeah, he'll be there with bells on, mate. Oh, you like this one? If he, uh, Matthew Bordenong says hi, boys, Matt. Any chance Dylan will ride the Bakerits? <laughs> yeah, two thousand and twenty uh, twenty-three. Won't be able. To, can't get him over two thousand twenty-two. But we'll work on two thousand twenty-three. <laughs> Now, also, Wean Dog, the, the signing has got a lot of the uh, the fans, particularly at the backstage pass. Love the Wean Dog. 
He brought some classic moments to backstage pass. That's from Kirsty Baxter. Um, are you really going to try and shake now that you're a sports director, you know, that old history of, you know, things like around the Mother's Day and, and having a laugh? And are you going to be one of those directors that sort of more feared than like? Oh, for sure. It's, uh, it's the character I am, you know, like, uh, um, yeah, if, 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 if they make the same sort of videos, uh, for sure, I'm going to be the same sort of guy again, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think also what the, what the people are loved about the backspace and stage pass is uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit loose, you know, like it's always a little bit uh, some funny side on it. And uh, that's what the people uh, like to see, you know, it's not always they don't have to see always the serious things. And uh, yeah, you made a, mi a mi good mix of that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can do that next year as well. If he... I so I've got fondest memories of uh, of that Giro stage you won. I think it was 2014. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. stage nine. Uh, stage nine, and uh, I got whacked into the into the team car because it was my birthday. So we had a joint celebration. Uh, we doggy won the stage, and uh, and the boys did uh, did a birthday cake for me. So the champagne came out, the birthday cake that night. That was a great night. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask you, what is um, it's ten years now since the start of the team. Um, it, it, does that feel like it's gone fast? Uh, it, in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. Uh, it is. It's it's pretty impressive. We're going into our second decade of a team now, as a team now, uh, and yeah, we we're, we're we're no longer the the new guys on the block. But uh, <laughs> things change, and, and and you've got to change and adapt to to the sport. And I think we've done a we've done a good job. Set, set, set a great route for next year, but yeah, when you think uh, of the camp back in Melbourne in end of November 2011, it does seem a long time ago. But uh, we've, had lot, we've had a lot of success since then, a lot of good times, and uh, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, continuing along that thread for for the next ten years. Now, Wendell, we we're talking to Whitey earlier about the importance of data. You were massive on data, particularly when you were training, yeah? Like, you were always rate riding based on your wattages and you were just so calculated. <laughs> Are you going to be passing that on to, to the younger riders, mate? No, as I told you before, that's uh, that's probably going to be the, the job of the coaches. Um, but, but the thing is... Uh, 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 Myself, I didn't do a lot with uh, with all the, all the data. Actually, the last couple of years uh, with Trek Sega Fredo, yeah, I had to work with it again. Uh, but uh, I know how it works, and uh, I trained with it and I raced with it. But uh, but but for me, it's also an important thing. Is also uh, that uh, that you have to learn how how your body reacts, how how you feel on that, and and not only watching the numbers, how many watts can I push, or this is my uh, these are the average watts, or this is this. Uh, sometimes you speak with uh, with guys and, uh, and, and and you ask them how do you feel or how is your shape? Yeah, I think I'm good because last week my numbers were okay. Yeah, that's not a that's not the answer. Eh? It's not a, the answer is yeah, I feel fit. Uh, you know, like something different than than only the numbers and a lot of guys right now are only focused on the numbers and i think you have to find a little bit of mixture uh, between that uh i think the most important is uh, that you feel fresh and fit in your head and uh and even if you push 10 watts uh, less your shape is going to be better than you push 10 watts more and you're only focused on your numbers and you're going to be stressed about it yeah well there's one thing excited about having wing dog on next year is he'll cut through the bullshit there's no rider that be able to just sort of weasel their way around stuff. Wayne will just call it as he sees it and put them back in their box. Oh, for sure, mate. But that's what that's why I, we I want him on board. Uh, and they, yeah. Peter Peter knew how to win a bike race, and uh, numbers or not, he he didn't win it from numbers. He won it from guts and character, and uh, I think that goes a long way because, uh, you know, like Peter said, you know, people, some of the young riders do get carried away with the numbers, and at the end of the day. There's a lot of those guys who've got great numbers who still haven't won in bike races, and uh, I think it, it's just finding that mix between yeah, the, the, the sports science has improved, the the data and the, the training has become more specific, but at the end of the day, you still got to cross the finish line first, and and that that's an that's an art form in itself, and then and, and us as sports directors, we're here to facilitate the growth of those athletes, and help them help them capitalise on the work they do at home 
when they get to a bike race, and that that does involve tactics. If he. <laughs> Before the show uh, start tonight, we did a little bit of social media and I put a little clip out there that we were having uh, uh, Whitey and the Wean Dog uh, uh, on the show and I got a message back from someone in sale who said, oh, we love uh, the Wean Dog in sale. You, you stayed because sale, of course, for the, for the non-Aussies who watch the show is like a country town in Victoria. And Peter, you stayed at, at Dan's place, but uh, you're you're more loved in sale than, than, than what Dan is. It's not hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was actually it was always a, uh, a good couple of weeks uh, staying over there in sale. It's a, yeah, it's a sort of uh, yeah, it's, it's countryside. So you go uh, outside Dan's uh, parents' place, you go to the right, and you're in the you're somewhere in the in the fields and uh, no traffic and uh, so for, for training it was a, it was really perfect up there uh, uh, yeah I liked always this uh, this week's in sale is pretty laid back uh, not much to do but uh, but uh, yeah for me it was a was a, was a perfect uh, perfect base to, to 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 build up a new season and uh, yeah I always had uh, good memories on uh, on sale didn't it didn't bloke tell you off once it was a stinking hot day you'd been out on a training ride and you pulled into like a, a service station in Stratford population of about 200 and you ordered an iced coffee and you started necking it and the guy told you off he's like what are you doing mate like you don't drink that and you're like ah and then you rode home, you're like, mate, some bloke gave me a ripping for skeleton and iced coffee. What is that? Uh, there was too, too many uh, too many fat was inside. It was like a, it was, it was a skinny uh, coffee, I reckon. So, oh, yeah, but, it's, uh, you know, like after a training ride of five hours, sometimes it doesn't matter what you eat or drink, you know, like sometimes you need to have calories inside your body. So and I was thinking, oh, a real nice iced coffee with uh, – Something like 32 degrees or 35 degrees, is, yeah, it would be good for me. And uh, so I was drinking iced coffee and this guy said, ah, that's not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, one, one other thing that I really liked about you as a rider, Wing Dog, was at the end of the season, you know, some riders, they need a mental break more than anything, particularly on the last couple of years. And you would literally have four weeks off, but I'd say to you, oh, mate, aren't you worried that, you know, you have a blowout? And you'd say, no, mate, because I train harder than anyone in the peloton so i'll come back and i'll smash myself into shape how important every year was that break for you not just physically but mentally uh actually uh my microphone or uh, I, I couldn't really uh understand what you what you quite say what you were saying but uh, uh but think, you should take uh, a month off uh, yeah, you have to find a sort of balance between uh, between uh, the season and the off season. Uh, it's not it doesn't mean that you go in the off season that it's always party and you don't train, but you have to find a sort of balance. You think with stuff you can't do uh, during the season, you have to do it in the off season. Um, so yeah, if you drink one time a beer, it's not a problem. You cannot go out every night or uh, stuff like that, but. But on a, on a certain moment, the time had, uh, has come that you have to start training again. And then from that moment on, yeah, you have to be serious again. And then it's all about, you know, like trying to get it back in shape and stuff like that. So, But that's that's the, the mentality a, a professional sportsman uh, needs to have. If you don't have that, you cannot be a, a top sportsman. So, yeah, sometimes you need to, to, to get the pressure off. And, and when that time uh, has been... It's 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 time to get serious again, and that's uh, yeah, that's a character you need to have. Now, what we were talking about earlier, the evolution of the team over ten years. You know, it started out opportunistic, then you know, with um, uh, more of a sprint type focus. Then it was GC. Um, now it's sort of morphing into something a little bit different. What what do you see the team characterised as now going into two thousand twenty two? Yeah, I think uh, you know Dylan. Dylan's contract is a three-year deal, so we've obviously now got a, a world-class spinner on the books for for three years. But I think we're we're sort of in a trend. We are definitely in a transitional phase at the moment. We've still got the likes of one of the world's best stage race riders in Simon Yates on the books. So you know he's a rider who has proved that you know he's won a Grand Tour third in third in, in last year's or this year's Giro d'Italia. And he gives us many options for the one-week races as well for GC. But um, yeah, then we've got Michael Matthews as well. So I think we've got a good cross-section of guys um, where we are going to 
be able to target wins throughout the year. And then we've still got a lot. We've got a we've got a young group as well with some really exciting developing talent, and uh, especially the likes of Lucas Hamilton and Caden Groves. And, and I expect to see some big things off those guys next year as well. If he- I was going to ask you about uh, Lucas Hamilton because you know it, it just didn't quite come together for him uh, this year. Johnny, it didn't come together for him from the tour onwards. I think I think when you when you when you go back and look at the results that he had from yeah you know, he, he did he did finish fourth in Paris East, he finished top, top eight in Catalonia, top I think it was fifth in Romandy. Uh, he had a very, very consistent spring, and he was in fifth place, fifth place at Tour of Switzerland when we had those four guys go down with a bout of a bout of uh, well, crook guts and whatever you want to call it. But who had, they had had to abandon Tour of Switzerland. And when he got to the tour, it, it just didn't happen for him. And then him and Simon Yates crashed out, and that was sort of the end of uh, that was the end of the form for the year. But you know, I, I really think he uh, he's in a good place to capitalise on that experience from from this year. And uh, to turn those top five places on GC into uh, into podiums next year, and same with Caden Groves. You know, Caden Groves turned pro at not the most opportunist, opportunistic time, the start of COVID. So he's had a pretty reduced uh, race calendar. Since he also caught COVID this year as well, so he, he's you know he's had sixty five races in two years, whereas normally guys would be looking at uh, that sort of race numbers per year. But uh, no, we believe in those two especially, and uh, I, I would be very surprised if between those two we don't get some very nice wins on top of our big name stars as well. And what in years gone by, you used to have directors that would sort of look after a handful of riders on the on the squad. Is that something that you still do? No, we sort of, we mate, we, we moved away from that sort of style when when we when we employed uh, the amount of coaches, you know, when we're talking in that style of, uh, of management, we had, uh, we had one coach. So we were using, we were using the sports directors as the high performance managers, but now with, uh, with five full-time coaches, yeah, we, we stepped back a little bit from, from that role there. And uh, our responsibility really is, well, we've all got different responsibilities, but you know, once we're at the race, that's where our responsibility really takes over. And the coaches, are the ones that that, that are hand on day to day contact, and, and they're the guys that uh, they're the guys that are making sure the boys get the work done at home or wherever they may be on training camp, and, and we sort of they sort of pass the ball on to us in the competition phase, and and we just have to have a good idea of uh, who we're managing, where those guys are at, and making sure that that aligns with uh, with the plan we have for those races and the year in general. Now, uh, Wayne Dog, part of being a sports director is you need to be accredited by the UCI at some point to do your director's course. That obviously requires a fair bit of research. You'd be really good at sticking your head in the books, mate. Yeah, I still got almost one year for that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's got that, that are all going to be like the, the things we, uh, I think, we already learned before. But there are also some things uh, uh, like uh, the bike measurements and stuff like that. Yeah, you have to stick your head in the books a little bit for that because if you get asked ask questions about your time trial bike and, and, and the positions on that and stuff like, uh, yeah, measurements. Yeah, for sure, you you, you have to learn them. Uh, you have to learn a little bit. But uh, yeah, still uh, one year away from us. And uh, yeah, well, I know we're. One one other factor is you're going to have to learn how to drive, you know, high performance cars because that rig that you were driving around a couple of years ago still had a cassette player in it. You're going to have to get used to <laughs> pedal power, mate. Yeah, 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 the Flintstone car is gone. Huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Uh, last year I was working for Shimano quite a couple, uh, quite a few days, and uh, so yeah. Also riding in the bunch of the cars there with all uh, the Flemish uh, races, so yeah, driving the car is not going to be a be a problem. Uh, yeah, but I have to say, like yeah, the the the, the cars improved also quite a bit uh, since uh, the last Opel Factor I had. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Ify, Whitey, I, I was going to go back. You, you mentioned uh, Simon Yates, and uh, he's been a superstar for you guys. Um, and he's had you know, the, the Giro has been a little bit of a uh, a, a quest for him because he's uh, you know the one he looked like was going to win, and then uh, last year he was right in the in the mix as well. Now I reckon he's got another Grand Tour in him, but on, uh, it won't be the Tour de France, but only because you know you, you, the, the Pogacars of this world and those guys uh, are just so strong and set for the Tour. I can't see him winning a Tour de France with a bit of luck, maybe a podium, but. 
Uh, are you going to set him for one of the, uh, either the Giro or the Vuelta? Yeah, look, I think I think the the organisers helped uh, helped us make that decision, and uh, I think realistically, also I agree with you 100, percent Johnny. I think with 55 kilometres of individual time trialling, it rules out most of most guys. You know, the I think even even the likes of Ineos, you know, you know, a Bernal or an Adam Yates. Yeah, you know, those guys are staring down the barrel of three, losing three minutes in the time trials alone. So I think when you look at the the Giro course for next year, it's the shortest amount of time trial kilometres for 30, for nearly forty years, um, with only twenty twenty nine or twenty eight kilometres of total time trialing over three and a half thousand kilometres, and uh, it, it, it's a race that uh, it's a race that we 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 want to. We want to finish a chapter on the Giro, and uh, that would be the one that we would uh, we'd love to win with him. And I, I really do believe that he's got the ability to win the Giro, um, and and it works well. Yeah, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see him at both uh, the Giro and the Tour, amongst many many of that style of rider. But it, it works well with our plans now, with also with Dylan, um, who would uh, who will who will yeah, he who who is really really keen on getting back and winning at the Tour de France and uh, I think when you're going to the race like to a race like the Giro with uh, with one of the favorites and a guy that you believe can win it's it's pretty hard to tick both boxes as in you know, chasing stages and chasing overall with it in a team of eight and uh, like I said I think between Simon between Michael Matthews and Dylan we've uh, we've got our grand tours uh, our grand tours covered and also now, for us, you know, we're working towards having Caden Groves ready to go for the World of España by the end of next year. I think I said because of his because of his age and when he turned professional, and him catching COVID, his his development has been slightly delayed, along with many guys who turned pro last year. But I really believe that by by the time we hit August, I think Caden will have racked up some nice wins for us, and uh, and he'll be ready to win even at the even at the Welter next year. Now, other race nice. schedule. It's very important. What are you planning to do with the wean dog? Throw him in the deep end for like Belgium opening weekend or maybe sit on your wheel at a race like Torino Adriatico, get him in car two, get a bit more of a feel for it and just ease him into it. Yeah, no, and I think with Peter, like, what, where, where I'm going to use Peter is to take him to the races that he knows it well and, and put him around some experienced people. So he's going to be with Dave McPartland straight up in Mallorca and Valencia. And then uh, he'll be doing uh, Welter Andalusia with myself at the end of February and then ba- Basque with me as well. So you know, races that, because at the end of the day, like I said before, we are see Peter's biggest strength immediately will be the fact that he, he could read a race as a rider and uh, he, he'll be able to trans transmit that that sense that race sense to our guys when they're trying to win stages uh, in those races that he knows very well himself so uh, we're, we're certainly not going to be throwing him in the deep end uh, that happened to me when I first turned turned as turned uh, into a sports director and we'll be certainly looking after Peter and but the, the sports directing side of things you'll pick up very quickly but uh, you know what you can't teach people is uh, is 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 culture, uh, and what you can't teach people is uh, is who they are, or change people. It's it's hard, quite hard to change, and I don't want Peter to change. I want him to say the the, the man that he is, and uh, you know he knows a lot of people already in our organisation. The people who don't know him will uh, will gain a lot of respect for him very very quickly. One other race based on experience, you'd have to consider taking to is obviously Liège, because a lot of people to to this day still talk about the Wing Dogs ride in two thousand fourteen. That uh, got Simon Gerrans the victory. Yeah, look, he's not. He's actually not on the age this year. Uh, he'll be with me in Basque the week before. But uh, no, you're right there. The, the ride that Peter did there with uh, when Simon Gerrans won was a big one, uh, and it was uh, it was it was, it was it, at that phase in the race inside the last minute that the race could have gone either way. And uh, but that just that's. That's the commitment that I want to see in our athletes, and and the commitment that Peter showed for for his leaders most of the time, and the, and the other part of the time was when he was going for wins himself, and that's the mentality that we want to install in all our young guys as well. You you've got two jobs to do, and that's that's either burying yourself for a leader or, or taking those opportunities to win for yourself, and uh, and there's no better guy than uh, than Peter to uh, to get that message across to our young fellas. Well, one final one. Pete, from me, is, you know, there's a lot of talk nowadays, particularly the younger riders, you know, you've got to be careful what you say to you, you've got to sort of massage them through or whatever. Uh, what's your opinion on that? 
Uh, wait a second. <laughs> Prickly question. Oh boy, hot shot. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you yeah, know, you got to be uh, soft. You go, you, you know, you, if you're angry or you're fired up or after a stage, you know, don't get too aggressive because it might take it the wrong way. You surely, surely. Yeah, that's uh, that. after a race. You always have to be a little bit be careful. Uh, also, uh, also uh, with the uh, yeah, the, the, the riders also themselves have to be a little bit be careful because uh, normally uh, after the race you're full of emotions uh, and sometimes. Uh, uh guys say things uh or yourself say things that that, that you think f five minutes and five minutes later you think like ah oh, maybe that was not the best thing so you have to be a little bit uh, uh reserved of that um so yeah uh yeah you have to listen to the riders and uh and yeah and then afterwards uh, when everything uh, is a little bit calm again you have to speak about uh about the things what 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 went wrong or, or what 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 was good sometimes you also have to say uh, the things that are good you know like sometimes uh, people are always pointing on the things that went wrong but sometimes you also give them a, a little bit of extra confidence and say like oh that was really great what you did there and that that's the way we want to continue uh, but on the other hand yeah you have to be a little bit reserved after the race and then let everybody do his own thoughts and then afterwards uh, everybody calm down a bit and you can start a discussion Oh, you're talking common sense, mate. What's going on? <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, Peter Williams, Whitey says, Grunewagen will love having Mezget as his lead out. There was a lot of talk about uh, how important uh, Mezget's going to be uh, for Dylan next year. Yeah, no, no. It, uh, look, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan is a very uh, analytical sprinter, and, and the talks I had with him before we signed him, he knew exactly who he had available in our roster for for leading him out. He worked with Armon Janssen at Jumbo Visma for four years, and uh, and also Luca. He, he he could see that Luca is uh, Luca is a bit of a magician when it comes to positioning, and I think I think Luca's is really excited. You know, like we spoke of before. You know, Michael Matthews is not a pure sprinter. He was he he, he did a lot of sprints, but you know, Michael's forte is when it gets really tough and and really gets too tough for the pure sprinters. And now, now for the first time for a long time, Michael's going to have uh, uh, one of the world's fastest men behind him. And I think uh, that oh, I know that excites Luca. And uh, you, you're going to see those two guys spending a lot of time together uh, at races. And uh, we've got a plan in spring there to keep them joined at the hip. And, uh, and then the plan is to get us off the mark very, very quickly in February with some uh, with some wins. I think it's going to be a great combination, and uh, there's a lot of experience between the two. Of them. Uh, it's always been a pleasure having Whitey and the Wee Dog on the show. If he anything you want to add before we wrap things up? No, I just want to thank you guys for coming on. I just want to, uh, congratulations to uh, Matty Wilson, ex, ex DS. Um, he's managed to put together. Uh, a, a bike race actually that happened finished today up, up in Queensland. It was a three day tour, uh, NRS race. And uh, congratulations to Brenton Jones, uh, um, who who won the overall and won the individual time trial as well. So he really has stepped up. So, uh, I, I did have his mum, uh, Karen Jones, on the phone telling me all about it just before we went to air. So, yeah, but well done, uh, Matty Wilson and the group up there in uh, in uh, Sunshine Coast. Yeah, AC, ACA uh, team, which the first race at a uh, national level for a, a long time. Yeah, well, de definitely great to see you racing back, back and uh, up and away. And uh, I suppose it's it's the start of uh, what's going to be a, a another limited summer of cycling. But uh, it's great that uh, that our riders have got some competition up in Queensland, and that. Uh, that racing is going to spread down through some of the uh, southern states over the next couple of weeks and into, into, into the early next year. And uh, it is, it's uh, about time. It's about time that we get some racing back in Australia because uh, you know, we've managed to put two seasons on in Europe right throughout the pandemic. And uh, yeah, it's time that people change their mentality and we learn to uh, learn to live with this virus. It's not, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And uh, at the end of the day, Australia is in a very good place compared to the rest of the world. Mm. Well, we want to obviously. So this is this is what I was going to say. This is your first time back in uh, Aussie for a couple, nearly three years, wouldn't it, Whitey? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, looking forward to seeing catching up with some family which I haven't seen for a while. But 
yeah, it'd be good to get out of this hotel room. I tell you, that's free. Um, the, re- the reason, the main reason I haven't come back is because there's no way I'll spend 14 days in quarantine with my kids. Um, 48 hours, 48 hours has been long enough. And uh, no. yeah, it won't punch up. Only <laughs> been one punch up the dude, but anyway. But um, it's, uh, it's 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 not normal for kids to be stuck in a room for for a, a, a sustainable amount of time. So it's they'll be they'll be happy to get out and looking forward to catching up with their cousins and their family uh, soon enough. Well, we want to wish obviously both you guys a, a very merry Christmas uh, and a, a massive two thousand twenty two. Uh, we've obviously gone into a fair bit of analysis, but it's all pointing towards a, a pretty big year for for all of you guys and and the organisation. So uh, we'll be cheering you on from the sideline, fellas. So thanks for joining the detour. Rest up, and Wing we, Dog. Uh, j- <laughs> we just let all the uh, the, the uh, detour fans know that we are going to do a, uh, a, a sort of a, an analysis of uh, of the. Um, Team Bike Exchange JK Women's Squad uh, sometime very soon. Yep, and make sure that you subscribe on the YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate all the support. We'll be back again on Thursday. We're going to do a bit of a best of iffy, and we're going to talk about a uh, chance to come over the Tour de France next year with uh, detour travel. So it's going to be a big one. So thanks, Whitey. Thanks, Weendon. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you again on uh, Thursday yeah. at 6.30 p.m. See you then. Cheers. Happy Christmas. This is the winning ride of the Tour de France.